Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. And I want a special thank you to all who donated flags for this wonderful cause. I want to remind people that we're still looking for donations. That's what makes this presentation so wonderful. We are especially looking for the 48 star flags for those deceased prior to 1960 to stay in tribute with that. Uh, we want to begin today's program with the posting of the colors, if you'll all now please stand and render the proper salute. Today's combined color guard is the American Legion, post 57, the AMBETS, post 202, the Marine Corps League, Elgin Detachment, 77, the Navy Club, Elgin Ship, number 7, the Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War Camp, number 2, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, post 1307. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem will be performed by Larkin High School Band under the direction by Brendan Dobbick. seated. Before we begin our program today, I'd like to thank some special people in the audience for being present. Elgin is well represented with city councilmen present, Toby Shaw, Rose Martinez, Richard Dunn, Terry Gavin, John Steffen, and John Priggy. If I've missed anyone, I apologize. Of course, we have our mayor, which I will introduce shortly. Now, please welcome to the podium for our today's invocation, the Reverend Dr. Nathaniel Edmond from the Second Baptist Church of Elgin. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we 
thank you for this day. We are grateful for your grace, your mercy, and your bountiful blessings. We have gathered to commemorate and celebrate those who have fought to protect our freedom. We thank you for those brave, bold men and women. They are our husbands and wives, our mothers and fathers, our sons and our daughters, who made the ultimate sacrifice to lay down their lives for their country. We ask that thou would bless each family and encourage them on today. We ask, O oh God, that you would bring peace in the world. Teach us how to live in peace. We ask that you will protect those who even at this hour stand guard over our freedom. We honor you, we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Reverend. Before we begin today's program, there are some other special people here that many of you recognize, but I believe they should be acknowledged. James Harvey, James Harvey Photography, also a veteran, making it possible on the web for everyone to see all of you and this program. Sam Olson, a young man who was nominated for an Elgin Image Award, a student at Elgin High School, videotaping this so that it'll be on YouTube for thousands to be able to see. Of course, the Elgin Patriotic Memorial Association Committee. We spend many, many hours putting all these programs together for all of you. And a special thank you to Rick Jekyll and the entire team at WRMN Radio. We welcome the listeners that aren't able to be here today. This entire program is broadcast live on WRMN. We're so lucky to have them as our local station. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm welcome to our mayor, David Captain. Thank you, Steve. Uh, welcome, uh, visitors to Bluff City Cemetery and Elgin, Illinois. We are blessed to live in the safest country in the world and in one of the safest cities in the United States. I think that sends a tribute back to the veterans to our first responders who have helped make our community what it is. 150 years ago, at the end of the Civil War, at the first, uh, uh, the first planning and the first decoration day at that time, that uh, talked about the uh, honoring of war veterans. Many of the veterans of the Civil War never came home, not because they died on the battlefield, they died afterwards. They died because of injuries, they died because of infection and the majority of the, of the casualties were, uh, uh, came after the uh, uh, battles. Today we're going to be honoring a nurse who's uh, served our country. And today, many of the veterans that come back have suffered grievous injuries that a hundred years ago would have killed them. And I think that we need to rededicate ourselves as a city and as a society to the care and nurturing of these injur injured men and women when they come back to the United States, both for mental issues and physical issues, and rededicate ourselves as a society to their care for as long as they live. And I think that's... <laughs> Each of us has an obligation, an obligation to honor those veterans and to take care of them, and we look forward to being able to do the best that we can do for them. Thank you very much for being here today, and enjoy the ceremony. I think every town wishes they had a mayor with the name Captain. <laughs> In keeping with tradition, it was 1868 that General John Logan wrote what is called Logan's Orders, which has become what Memorial Day really is all about. A day honoring not veterans, but fallen veterans. We have always had at this program a local area youth 
read Logan's orders. Our reader today is Tiger Kaukunso. He's a junior in the Beacon Academy at South Elgin High School. He's also involved in the Elgin Youth Leadership Academy. He is in drama and a very involved musician who plays the guitar and the piano. He likes to post his musical creations on YouTube, but he is very honored and humbled to be here today. Please welcome Tiger to the podium. I just wanted to thank Youth Leadership Academy and City of Elgin for this amazing opportunity. This is General Orders number 11. One. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, hamlet, and churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized, comrades, as our regulations tell us for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead, who made their hearts a barricade between our country and its foes? Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that contracted consecrated wealth and toils of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull and other hands black and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remains to us. Let us then, at this time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag that they saved from dishonor. Let us, in the solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us. A sacred charge upon a nation, gratitude to the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. Two, it is the purpose of the commander-in-chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the, no the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for a simultaneous compliance therewith. Three, department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective. By order of John A. Logan, Commander in Chief. Thank you. At this time, one of our most solemn moments, we will have a roll call of deceased of veteran organizations. First to the podium, the representative from the American Legion, Post 57. Members of Post 57 who have passed on since May 15th of last year, Arnold Kenneth L. 
Vietnam Army, Vaughn, John A., World War II Navy, Becker, Robert A., World War II Army, Beckman, William, Korea, Marine, Bell, Robert, W. W. Two, Army, Lilac, Robert E., World War II, Navy, Future, Korea, Army, Drew, Gerald, World War II, Army, Field, David, World, Korea, Army, Gilbert, Jerry, Korea, Army, Dieselbrecht, John, World War II, Air Force, Gustafson, Howard W., Korea, Coast Guard, Paul, Kendall, Lebanon, Granada, Navy, Holt, Norman, World War II, Army, Ingham, William J., World War II, Army, Kawa, Luella, Vietnam, Navy, Kohler, Charles E., World War II, Army, Concus, Charles, Vietnam, Army, Lang, Elmer, World War II, Army, Leaf, William F., Korea, Air Force, Lochner, Mary B., World War II, Army, Maha, Gregory J., Korea, Army, Nicholson, Donald B., World War II, Army, Miller, James R., Vietnam Navy, Molo, Albert F., World War II, Army, Morovic, Mark, Vietnam Navy, Natalie, Michael, World War II, Merchant Marine, Philip, William T., World War II, Army, Pop, William H., Korea, Army, Prem, Rem, Elmer E., Korea, Navy, Eager, Robert G., Army, Prager, John E., World War II, Army, Tyson, Lyle, Korea, Army, Wentz, Wentz, Kessinger, Korea, Navy, Westbrook, William C., Korea, Army, Zimmerman, Freedom C., World War II, Army, May their souls rest in peace. Next, American veteran AMVETS, post 202. Lee Barrett, Korea, Army. Mike Natale, Merchant Marine, World War II. Disabled American Veterans. No report. Marine Corps League, Detachment 77. No report. Navy Club, Elgin Ship 7. Michael Natale. Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War Camp Number 2. It is with deep regret I report the passing of, of real son, 
Brother Carson Yeager, World War II Army. Veterans of Foreign Wars, post-1307. Wilbur Ackman, J.V. Verna Jr., Lester J. Carlson, Joseph Clements, Robert L. Pundit, Donald B. Hughes, Jerry J. Gilbert, Harold R. Hopp, Robert E. Hood, W. J. Ingham Jr., Richard B. Jensen, Frank F. Juris, Charles F. King, Ralph Kohlhoff, Richard E. Kruger, Robert F. Kucharski, Louis P. Lesnick, Robert W. Loach, Erwin R. Lukey, Glenn M. Matting, Milford Morocco, James D. Peters, Frederick Richardson, Jr., Alvin Schlafman, Robert B. Shannon, Arthur J. Sheehan, James A. Stephan, Robert K. Thayer, Wayne M. Vanderbilt, Francis Workman, James C. Young, Jr. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a musical selection by the Larkin High School Band, again directed by Brendan Dobbick.
keeping with tradition, the Gettysburg Address is a document that so many of us know of, and we remember it, but do we ever really think about what it really means? Since the conclusion of the Civil War, when Lincoln wrote that and stated it, it has been a very special, meaningful speech throughout the history of this land. It has always been a tradition to, again, have a Elgin area youth reader read the Gettysburg Address during our presentation today. Today's reader is Yanitza Hernandez, an eighth grader at Abbott Middle School. Yanitza is in the eighth grade at Abbott. She's also involved in the Elgin Youth Leadership Academy. She's on the student council as an ambassador. She's in the orchestra and plays soccer and basketball. And she is also very proud to be part of this program today. Please give her a warm welcome to the podium. I would like to thank Youth Leadership Academy in the Elgin community and my mother for driving me here. <laughs> four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to a proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that nation might live. It is all together fitting that proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have concentrated it. Far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to a great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall not shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln, November 19th, 1863. It's now time for the floral tributes to the tomb. If we could clear the tomb area there. First, American Legion, Post 57, Ladies Auxiliary. American Veteran AMVETS, Post 202. Disabled American Veterans.
the Elgin Fraternal Order of the Eagles, post 1047. Belgian United Civic Association. The Elgin Fraternal Order of Elks, Lodge 737. The Knights of Columbus, Council 654. <laughs> Navy Club, Elgin Ship, number seven. Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, Camp Number Two. Veterans of Foreign Wars, post-1307, Ladies Auxiliary. there are any other member organization floral tributes, please come forward at this time. Today's Memorial Day address is a special tribute to 50 years ago, Vietnam. Lorraine Dar is a native of the Pittsburgh area where she grew up as the oldest of six children. After graduating from Mount Sinai Academy for Girls, she went on to the Pittsburgh Hospital School of Nursing, graduating in 1969. After one year stint with Mercy Hospital in Pittsburgh, working in the newly formed cardiac care unit, she joined the U.S. Air Force. In 1970, she was sent to serve at Kessler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. The following year, she volunteered to go to Vietnam and was assigned to the U.S. military base at Cam Ranh Bay. After her discharge, she married Jack Dar, whom she had met during her first assignment in Mississippi. And after one year working in obstetrics at Loring AFB, they settled in his hometown of Elgin. Mrs. Dar went on to earn her bachelor's in nursing and has spent many years working at both St. Joseph Hospital and Sherman Hospitals in Elgin until her retirement in 2013. She and Jack have now been married 42 years and are the parents of two grown sons. Her hobbies include reading, traveling, knitting. 
He's also a lifetime member of the VFW. Please give a warm welcome to the podium, today's guest speaker, Lorraine Dar. Good morning, everyone. I am honored and privileged to speak to you today. Thank you to Jerry Turnquist and the Elgin Memorial Day Committee for all your hard work organizing this beautiful program and all the other programs happening in Elgin today. While we remember all the men and women who have died serving this country, the program today commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War and pays special tribute to women who served as nurses in the military. I was asked to speak today because I was an Air Force nurse who served 10 months in Vietnam. So I am here today to honor those who died in Vietnam and also as a reminder that women also voluntarily served and died in every war and conflict America has entered. I would first like to share some childhood memories of Memorial Day, which was originally celebrated on May 30th. In my family, it was called Decoration Day and was also known as Grandma's Birthday. My mother's mother was born in Pittsburgh on May 30th, 1888. Her early life was filled with many losses. Because she was orphaned at age six, she was raised by her uncle and grandmother, alongside her cousin Gilbert, who had also lost his mother. This cousin, Private Gilbert Joseph Carr, at age 20, was killed in action in World War I. I remember looking at the picture of him in uniform that hung on her bedroom wall in one of those old oval frames. When I look back on her Decoration Day birthday celebrations in the 50s and 60s, I wonder what her memories were of all those people she lost. I wish now that I had asked her about Gilbert. Gilbert had no siblings and was never married, so if not for Memorial Day, would be forgotten. Gilbert was my only family member, I can thankfully say, that was killed in action. My father, an Army Master Sergeant, returned home safely after serving four years in Europe during World War II. In the Vietnam era of anti-war sentiment and political unrest, with no public notice, 265,000 military women volunteered to go where they were needed. Eight United States service women, all nurses, died in Vietnam. According to the Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation, approximately 11,000 American military women were stationed in Vietnam during the war. Close to 90% were nurses. Others served in many other capacities. An unknown number of civilian women also served as news correspondents and in humanitarian organizations such as the Red Cross. Many of these women were killed or wounded in the crossfire. In 2015, we think nothing of seeing women soldiers going into combat or women police officers on our streets. This is a fairly recent development and was far from accepted roles for women in the Vietnam era. In my three-year diploma school nursing class, five of us enlisted in the first year after graduation. I am the only one who was assigned to Vietnam. So why did we enlist? Besides wanting to make a difference and serve our country, we were looking forward to travel and adventure. We came from a middle, ba middle class background with not a lot of extra money for travel. Nursing salaries were enough to pay the rent and own a car and not a lot left over. The military offered one month vacation, a job, a place to live, and the lure of travel. How hard could military life be, we asked ourselves. We had just graduated from three years of nursing school, also known as boot camp. That included rules and curfews and long hours. When you were a nurse back then, you were expected to work wherever you were sent, also known as other duties as assigned in the job description. My high school BFS mother was a World War II Army nurse who was stationed in North Africa and told enticing stories of her service in a foreign country. Also, I grew up reading Cherry Ames books. Cherry Ames was a fictional nurse who could 
could, could and did everything. Thus, there was Cherry Ames flight nurse, Cherry Ames army nurse, truth nurse, dude ranch nurse, you get the idea. So anyway, we were young, idealistic, and up to any challenge. I spent approximately two years, 1970 to 1972, in the United States Air Force, one year at Keesler Medical Center in Biloxi, Mississippi, and then 10 months in Southeast Asia at the United States Air Force Hospital at Cameron Bay. I did not take care of combat casualties. My patients were airmen with the usual maladies that you would find in any stateside hospital. I cared for Vietnamese women, men, and children who were afforded expert medical care not found in their villages. The Army nurses, however, were in the midst of battle casualties and after the war suffered as high a rate of PTSD as their brother servicemen. The Air Force flight nurses made a unique and valuable contribution to the war effort by participating in the air evacuation of battle casualties. All women who served during the era had the universal experience of being far from home with long-awaited letters as the only means of communication with family and friends. We lived in an era of no cell phones, internet, or Skype. We were mostly confined to base and guarded. We were all referred to as round eyes to distinguish us in conversation from Asian women. We were treated with respect and deference, even if we were sometimes ogled. Women, as in all prior wars, represented a normal way of life and a reminder of home to the men. We loved the Vietnamese people and especially the women we hired who cleaned our rooms and washed and ironed our clothes. We witnessed what war does to countries and families. Years later, on Veterans Day, November 11, 1993, I attended the Women's Memorial dedication. It was an extremely moving experience. Women vets gathered behind the banners of the units they served under and walked to the memorial site. Thousands of veterans lined the streets applauding and saying thank you. Some were hoping to find that special nurse that took care of them. I didn't think I would see anyone I knew from my unit, so I was reluctant to go. Encouraged by my husband Jack, a Vietnam vet, we went, and there to my surprise were all those people I spent time with so long ago. It was an overwhelming and fitting that there be a monument to the women who selflessly served this country. The monument depicts three uniformed women with a wounded soldier. The woman praying is named Faith. The woman looking up is named Hope. And the woman tending the soldier is named Charity. So today we remember with faith that our fallen soldiers are in a better place. With hope that the future will bring peace, and with charity that the wounds of war will be healed. Thomas Campbell said, to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Memorial Day means every soldier who died is remembered and held in the hearts of this country. On this Memorial Day, let us remember and keep in our hearts the eight women who died in Vietnam. First Lieutenant Sharon Ann Lane, Second Lieutenant Pamela Dorothy Donovan, Lieutenant Colonel Annie Ruth Graham, who was also a veteran of World War II and Korea, Captain Mary Therese Klinker, Second Lieutenant Carol Ann Elizabeth Drasba, Second Lieutenant Elizabeth Ann Jones, Captain Eleanor Grace Alexander, and First Lieutenant Hedwig Diane Orlowski, and their brother soldiers named on the wall. Let us remember and keep in our hearts the fallen in America's past and present conflicts and your families and friends who are no longer here. I will remember my cousin Private Gilbert Joseph Carr, my grandmother, and all the Memorial Day picnics with family no longer here. I think if our fallen soldiers could send us a message, it would say, enjoy the day and the freedom that we fought and died for. Thanks for never forgetting us. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to share my thoughts today. God bless all our troops, veterans, and their families. God bless all wounded warriors. God bless all of you. And God bless America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you.
now, ladies and gentlemen, pleased to have with us today, as always, the Elgin Master Choral, formerly known as the Elgin Choral Union, for a musical selection. This is under the direction today of John Worf. Oh, sunrise until noon. In keeping with that tradition, today we have two Vietnam veterans flag raisers to raise our flag to full staff. Our flag raisers today are Vietnam vet Jack Dar and Rick Grimm. Musical accompaniment by Don Wessner.
If you will now all please remain standing. Gentlemen, remove your hats. All please render the proper salute and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, before our benediction today, the last three things run together. Following the benediction will be our rifle salute, and following that will be taps. But as we are focused on the American flag raising, you've all come into this beautiful display of flags today, unlike anything in this area. There's a gentleman right out in front of me in the audience responsible for all these flags, as they call it, the Avenue of Flags. Marv Schmidt, years ago from Bluff City Cemetery, started this tradition. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Marv. Before our benediction today, the rifle salute will be the Combined Color Guard, American Legion Post 57, AMVETS Post 202, Marine Corps League 77, Navy Club Elgin Ship 7, Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War Camp, Veterans of Foreign Wars 1307. Following will be taps performed by Brendan Berg of Larkin High School with the taps echo effect by David Weaver. Our benediction today, we are honored to have Lieutenant Adrian Townsend with us. Adrian Townsend is a native of Manhattan, New York, she attended Atlantic Union College in South Lancaster, Massachusetts, and received a Bachelor of Science degree, a Master of Arts degree, and a Master of Divinity degree. She began her Navy career in June of 05 as a reservist in the Chaplain Candidate Officer Program. In June of 08, Chaplain Townsend was commissioned a Lieutenant Junior Grade in the Navy Chaplain Corps as the first female minister from the Seventh-day Adventist Church to become a United States Navy chaplain. Townsend was promoted to the rank of lieutenant in September of 2009, and in September of 2011, she reported to the USS Tortuga in Japan, where she served as the command chaplain. October 2013, Lieutenant Townsend reported to Training Support Center Great Lakes where she currently serves as staff chaplain. Please, a warm welcome to Lieutenant Adrienne Townsend for our benediction. Let us pray. Almighty God, we want to thank you this morning for guiding us in this service as we, your people, have taken the time to intentionally pause and remember those military nursing professionals who came before us and with honor, they shared with us and left us a legacy of hope, faith, charity, determination, and sacrifice. We pray that through your strength, wisdom, and mentoring on solidarity that we will remain fundamentally committed to supporting our nurses and medical corps care providers so that they may continue to provide excellent care to the present and future generations of those who will bravely serve, defend, and protect our nation. We end, Father, with the words of the Navy hymn that say, Creator, Father, who first breathed in us the life that we received. By power of thy breath, restore the ill and the men with wounds of war. Bless those who give their healing care 
that life and laughter all may share. God, continue to bless America. In your mighty name we pray this afternoon. Amen. Now for the rifle salute. This concludes our program today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for coming. Remember what Memorial Day is all about. And I encourage you all to thank a veteran every day. That's why we're here. It's why we live in the land of the free. Have a safe day, everyone. Happy Memorial Day.